Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of Rocket Racket for deposit into your eye sockets uh, of all the news relating to space this week. I'm sorry, I should have given up my dream of being a freestyle rapper a long time ago. Regardless, in this show we cover all the Starship news from last week, all the launches we saw last week, preview all the upcoming events this week, and provide a comprehensive overview of all the best spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the coming seven days. And with intros and salutations aside, let's begin our first segment, all the biggest developments relating to SpaceX's Starship. I don't think I could begin my Starship coverage this week without first off acknowledging this brand new release from Corey at Seabass Productions. This absolutely incredible render of the Starship Orbital Test Flight released just this weekend after being in the works for a very long time. This was a collaborative effort between Corey, Neopork, Alex Svan, Sam Krug, Spaceport 3D and Nick Henning and the wait was definitely worth it. The video, a link to which of course is in the description, depicts the first flight of the Starship orbital test campaign, beautifully illustrating the ascent from the orbital launch platform, stage separation, and then the Falcon 9 style descent of the colossal Super Heavy down toward the Gulf of Mexico, where in this early phase of development it will soft land in the water, much like how the early Falcon 9 landing tests were done. Back in space, the Starship will accelerate up to orbit, I love the internal shot of the fuel tank in Zero-G here, before performing a controlled re-entry, after which it will perform a soft splashdown in similar fashion to Super Heavy, just off the coast of Hawaii. Regardless of how successful this test flight goes, and let's be honest here, there is quite a high chance of fireworks, this will be quite the sight to behold, and this new render here definitely instills new levels of anticipation for SpaceX's orbital test campaign, which they plan to begin within the next next few months. Of course, a lot needs to happen before then. Chiefly, they actually need the infrastructure to support the orbital launch. SpaceX are hard at work on building the necessary components for this. The orbital launch integration tower is rapidly piercing the Boca Chica skyline. It's being assembled modularly and the rate at which it's growing, I can't imagine it'll be too much longer before it's completed. The other half of the launch site is the orbital launch stand itself. We've seen the vertical extensions of the initial base pillars get added over the course of last week, with the the sixth and final pillar extension being installed on the 5th of June. The launch table itself will be attached to these pillars, which will contain the launch clamps and infrastructure associated with the sound suppression system, as the roar from those 29 and eventually 32 engines will definitely shake the earth. Eric posted a proposed configuration of what a 32 engine layout would look like. He made this after Elon Musk gave some feedback about corrections he could have made on his initial render, and I think this new one came out looking spectacular. Launch site aside, SpaceX will also also, you know, need to actually have the rocket ready too. Luckily, they've got that covered as well. BN2, formerly known as BN3, but has since apparently been internally rechristened to BN2, is quickly taking shape inside the high bay, and SN20, the starship that will conduct the orbital test flight, continues to be fabricated. Brendan once again never fails to supply us with an excellent overview graphic of the whole picture, although all this progress with SN20 and BN2 kind of makes you wonder what the plan is for SN16. It's sort of stuck in limbo. It's fully built, but it's sitting in the high bay without any news on what, if anything, it'll be used for. It might still make a flight, but that's looking less and less likely given that SN15 has seemingly met any and all objectives that SN16 could possibly achieve, and speaking of SN15, it's had its raptors removed and has been placed on a display mount near the entrance of Starbase, where it'll serve as an impressive monument at the site. Time will tell for SN16, it would seem. What do you think SpaceX should do with SN16? I've already highlighted that it could easily be used as a grain silo for SpaceX Whiskey Distillery for their High Bay Bar, but I'm also a big fan of SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric's idea of turning it into a super practical all-terrain land ship vehicle. Or maybe it could be used as a test platform for a permanent and reusable Starship landing leg design. Maybe like this super realistic and serious design proposal of two T-Rex leg appendages attached to the middle of the fuselage supporting the Starship after an SN9 style descent. Who knows, really, it could be anything. <laughs> Over at the sub-orbital launch site, a Super Heavy test tank, BN 2.1, has been rolled out, where it's currently undergoing testing ahead of the rollout of BN 2 on a modified nose cone test stand and thrust simulator. Hopefully, no major flaws are picked up, and the first orbital launch will go ahead as planned. And pff, it's gonna be awesome to see. And the rate at which SpaceX are progressing with Starship is quite the achievement in and of itself. But I'm gonna end my weekly coverage of Starship there, though if you want more 
more test footage of Starship prototypes, then why not check out Launex's latest video on my channel created by me, where I launched and flew 29 Starship prototypes before ending up with a finalized design. I had a lot of fun making it, and I think you'd enjoy it if you haven't seen it yet. There's a card on screen and a link in the description for your viewing pleasure. Anyway, with Starship done and star dusted, let's take a look at what else was going on last week elsewhere in the world of spaceflight. Last week, we saw the sixth crew EVA, or spacewalk, from the International Space Station for 2021. This involved cosmonauts Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov, and was the second in a series of spacewalks to decommission the aging Piers airlock, which is scheduled to be replaced by the new Naoka module in the summer. This EVA involved the removal of docking antennae, EVA gap spanners, and the transfer of some of the components over to the Poisk module. All in all, the EVA lasted a total of 7 hours and 19 minutes. We also had some launches last week as well. The first was on the 2nd of June and was a Chinese Long March 3BE, which placed a Fenyan 4B meteorology satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit on behalf of the China Meteorological Association. The next launch was on the 3rd of June and was a SpaceX Falcon 9 International Space Station crew resupply mission using a Cargo Dragon spacecraft. This was quite a special launch as this was the first ever flight of a brand new Falcon 9 first stage and the first flight of a brand new Cargo Dragon. Feels weird seeing a brand new SpaceX rocket fly, even though that's the case for literally every other launch we see in the world. This is the first time SpaceX have flown a brand new booster in 2021, and hopefully this particular first stage sees many more flights to come after its successful touchdown on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. One cool feature of this launch was the fact that this was the first ever time SpaceX have flown a brand new Falcon 9 without conducting a static fire test beforehand, an amazing showcase of the reliability and dependability of the Falcon 9 and its Merlin engines. The Dragon spacecraft contained a number of things, some pretty standard for a resupply mission such as science investigations, crew supplies and spacewalk equipment, but the Dragon also contained the first pair of a new rollout solar array for installation on the station. These will supplement the existing solar panels on the International Space Station and rollout arrays are a relatively new technology. They're lightweight and flexible solar panels designed to provide much more energy than traditional panels while also coming in at a much lower mass being flexible and rollable and operating in a similar fashion to how a measuring tape unwinds on its spool. The current designs are 20% lighter and four times smaller in volume than a rigid panel equivalent with the same performance. In addition to the space station cargo, the launch also carried three CubeSats, all designed for technology demonstration purposes, one from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, one for RAMSAT in the United States, and one for the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council in the Republic of Mauritius. This is the first Mauritian satellite ever launched, in fact. <laughs> The final launch we saw last week was another Falcon 9, yesterday on the 6th of June. This Falcon launched a single satellite, the SXM-8, on behalf of Sirius XM, a satellite and online radio service provider in the United States. The satellite was placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit, joining the existing XM constellation and bringing the total number in orbit to 6. The previous satellite launched for Sirius, the SXM-7, was launched in December 2020. However, while the launch and deployment all went well, the satellite failed during its in-orbit checks and subsequently died, putting a $225 million sized hole in Sirius XM's wallet. Eesh. Hopefully the SXM-8 performs a little bit better. Anyway, now my coverage of last week is done and dusted, let's take a look at what's going on this week. But hey, before we do, if you're enjoying this video, please do remember to hit like down below. It really does help channels out and I'm always grateful for your support of these videos. Anyway, as mentioned, let's press on. This week starts off not on Earth, but in deep space. On this very day, the 7th of June, NASA's Juno probe will make its 34th perijove, or the lowest point in its orbit around Jupiter. It will also fly by the moon Ganymede, the most massive of all of the solar system's moons, and in doing so will reduce its orbital period around Jupiter from 53 to 43 days. This will set up the probe to make a close flyby of Europa in September 2022, which will further reduce its orbital period to 38 days, with a further two flybys, this time of the moon Io, occurring in 2023 and 24, reducing its period down to 33 days. 
This will help Juno meet its extended mission objectives, more closely study Jupiter's pole, its enigmatic great blue spot, its faint rings, and of course make observation of Jupiter's moons, in particular Europa and Io, to help better prepare the upcoming Europa Clipper and the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer missions. As far as launches go this week, there's only the one, and it happens right at the end of the week, on Sunday the 13th of June. This will be Virgin Orbit's latest mission, dubbed Tubular Bells Part 1, and will be using the Launcher 1 vehicle, which of course launches from the air after being deployed by the Cosmic Girl, Virgin Orbit's modified 747 aircraft. Inside the payload fairing are four CubeSats destined for low Earth orbit. We have the STP-27 VPA technology demonstration satellite from the United States, the BRIC-2 technology demonstration CubeSat from the Netherlands, and two Earth observation CubeSats from Poland, the Stork 4 and Stork 5. Launcher 1 is a really fun rocket to watch, given how different it is from what we're used to seeing, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing this one fly. But that's a wrap on my rundown of this week. Not a lot of activity, I know, but spaceflight is always the subject of rapid change and reschedule, so I'd imagine we may end up being surprised at some point during the week. And even if we're not, there's still lots of historic anniversaries associated with spaceflight this week. Let's take a look at those now. The first historic anniversary that I want to talk about this week is actually not that old. It's only a couple of years ago, on the 8th of June 2007. Wait, 2007 was 14 years ago? Well, well now, I'm, now I'm sad. But regardless, on the 8th of June in 2007, a couple of years ago, was the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis on mission STS-117. This mission marked the 250th human spaceflight ever, and on this flight the shuttle delivered the second starboard truss segment, S3-S4, and associated energy systems to the International Space Station, which is the heaviest station payload the shuttle has ever carried. The main functions of the S3-S4 truss segment are to provide electrical power and data interfaces for the station's electronics, and generate electricity using solar power. They also provide active thermal protection to the space station and allow the connection of platforms to store parts. On the 10th of June in 2003, a Delta II rocket launched the Spirit Rover to explore the surface of Mars. This, I'm sure, is a mission you're all familiar with. Spirit and its twin rover Opportunity landed on separate spots on Mars and both far outlived their planned mission duration of 90 Martian days. Spirit ended up operating for 2,208 Martian days, or 6 years and 77 days on Earth. It met its maker when it tragically became stuck in a sand trap in late 2009, which left it at an angle that left its solar panels without adequate exposure to sunlight, and as such its batteries ran down and its systems eventually shut down. The last communication with Earth was sent in March 2010. During its mission, Spirit travelled almost 8 kilometres across the surface of Mars, conducting an extensive geological analysis of the planet's rocks and surface features. Next up, we have another Delta II launch, this one on the 11th of June in 2008. This particular Delta II launched the GLAST Space Telescope, GLAST being an acronym that stands for Gamma Ray Large Area Space Telescope. I know that the space telescope that everyone thinks of when they hear the term space telescope is the Hubble, which is kind of understandable since it takes photographs of the visible light spectrum and is therefore more marketable, but the GLAST telescope should get some love too. This telescope, as the name suggests, uses gamma ray astronomy to observe the universe from low Earth orbit. In fact, it's the most sensitive gamma ray telescope we have in orbit. The telescope has made some notable discoveries over the years. For example, in 2008, the telescope detected a pulsar in the CTA-1 supernova that appeared to emit radiation in the gamma ray bands only, the first pulsar observed to do so. It also discovered the greatest gamma ray burst ever, which took place in the Carina constellation. It was noted to have the largest apparent energy release ever measured. The explosion itself had the power of about 9,000 ordinary supernovae, and it's estimated that the ejected material must have been accelerated to 99.9999% the speed of light. On the 13th of June, the space probe Pioneer 10 became the first man-made object to leave the central solar system as it passed beyond the orbit of Neptune. I know Voyager 1 and 2 get all the attention for interstellar space probes, but Pioneer 10 was actually the first to exit the central solar system. That's not its only achievement, mind. Pioneer 10 was also the first spacecraft to visit Jupiter, the first to cross the asteroid belt, and, by virtue of what I stated earlier, the first of the five man-made objects to achieve the escape velocity needed to leave the solar system. 
The spacecraft has long since died due to insufficient power, and although it was the first, it's no longer in the lead. The Voyager spacecraft travelled much faster than Pioneer 10, and as such, Voyager 1 overtook Pioneer 10 in early 1998, and Voyager 2 is expected to pass in April 2023. One of the coolest things about Pioneer 10, and its sister Pioneer 11, is that both carry a small gold anodized aluminium plaque depicting a human male and female, along with several symbols designed to provide information about where the spacecraft came from, in case it's ever discovered by intelligent life forms from another planetary system. The achievements of Pioneer 10 were the last things I wanted to discuss this week, which therefore brings an end to our anniversary segment. What an exciting week! From the news from Juno and Ganymede, to the always amazing spectacle of Falcon 9, and with the ever-looming promise of a Starship orbital flight rapidly approaching, right now really is the best time to be alive for space fans. If you enjoyed this video guys, then do remember to leave a like, it really helps, and hey, if you really enjoyed it, perhaps you want to put your name alongside these fine folk on the left, all my Patreon supporters. It's your support that really helps this channel keep on trucking, and that's not even without me mentioning all the members of the Lounge Squad, which you can join by clicking the join button below the video, and get yourself a cool badge next to your name, and a unique array of emojis to spam in the comments below. <laughs> Anyway, I've waffled on far too long now, so I'll leave you with the two videos visible on screen that are also from my channel. Click those if they look interesting if you, if you want. And that's it. Goodbye.